All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, sit down, situate yourself, uh, and then we can uh, begin. Uh, hey, everyone, welcome to the second night of Game Developers Week. Um, yeah. <laughs> We are gonna have uh, two great talks tonight, um, and I don't wanna, you know, ramble on for too long. So I think we're just gonna get started with Rick Levine, real Renaissance man. He is a game developer, software engineer, writer, and educator. Um, and tonight he's going to be giving a talk about staying creative. So everyone, give him a warm welcome. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, I want to thank you all for, for coming here and uh, listening to me today. I, I'm a, considered a classic video game developer, which means I've been in the business a long, or I was in the business for a long time from the late 70s. And so I'm going to start just by saying my name's Rick Levine. That's my, my uh, website if you want to check me out afterwards. And I've been lucky enough to be a video game developer throughout most of my career. The talk today is staying creative, and what I want to try to get across is that video game technology and the technology in general moves very quickly. So whatever you're learning today and whatever you think the greatest technology is today it will be something different five years from now or three years from now even. And it just keeps moving along. It has through my career, and I don't see any reason why it won't keep doing that. So staying in the business, requires some amount of flexibility and creativity as well as being a creative person to, to be interested in video games. And um, that's what this, this uh, screen you're looking at basically tries to tell you is that from Pong to the game I did in 1982 is a fairly big jump in just a period of uh, a little about 10 years I think was the difference between those two games. But if you look at the difference between Microsurgeon which is the game I did uh, and these other games on the right, uh, and then of course future technologies there on the far right, there's an there's even huger difference, and of course we're talking about a 30 year difference. So the, the differences between now and what you're going to see 10 years from now or 30 years from now is going to be immense as well. Who can tell what will be? So if you want to stay in the business or stay in any creative business from now into the time where maybe you feel like retiring, the best way to do it I think is to stay flexible, and remember the um, silent movie stars, because I always do. A lot of people didn't make it from silent movies into talking movies, but some did. And how did they do it? They stayed flexible. They said, okay, well, I used to be a big star, and I used to be a, a, uh, a comedian, or I was, a, I, I was you know, great at action films. But when they moved into talkies, they wanted somebody to do something else because their voice sounded different, or they looked different. And the best way to do that was to stay flexible and they found new things to do. And that little boy there on the left, I think, is Jackie Coogan. And he later became Fester on, uh, what was the Adams, Adams Family? Yeah. Adams Family. Mm -hmm. So in my own career, I'm just going to use this as an example for hopefully you know, showing you how you your interests can help you to stay flexible. My interests are there on the left, and then all of the different things that I did throughout my career are on the right. And so I'm going to use different parts of my career as an example of, as examples in this talk that I hope will do a couple of things. Is one, show you how my interests connected to the things that I did to stay flexible and creative. And two, just um, to uh, show you a, a variety, of, variety of ways that, that hopefully might inspire you in your own careers. So what were my interests? Uh, as a child growing up, uh, I, I loved mathematics, and I also tutored mathematics. I loved board games because when I was a kid, there was no video games, of course. Um, so there were, there, but the board games were huge. And card games, of course, were a really big deal. And of course, all kinds of games. So understanding the history of games, uh, which, you know, card games, chess, checkers, all of that, uh, it, it was important to me, and it, it, I, hopefully it is, is important to you, too, to understand 
what went on before you because you know 30 years from now you'll be looking back going you know what went on before the, the, the people that are getting into video games then and I was inspired by science fiction I love reading stories about planets and, and uh, other other uh, uh, aliens and, and, and other technologies and Isaac Asimov was just one of many authors that I really grew to love his stories. And by the way, he also sold technology and, and advertisements uh, uh, in the early days of computing. My whole family loved to bowl, and I will show you a little later how bowling became a big part of my, uh, how I connected that interest with video game development later on. Travel, it wasn't just travel that inspired me, although I love to travel, I always do. But I, but I love planning travel. I love figuring out the distances and how I can you know, arrange as many things as possible in the, in the first two weeks of, of uh, you know, the, the, the vacation or whatever and get, get a lot of different things done. Movies inspired me. Uh, I had an interest in all kinds of movies, but especially I love science fiction and fantasy movies. And so these are just an example of some of the movies that I really liked. And if you don't know that, that, that one on the top left is Forbidden Planet. And of course, uh, when I was a kid, Robbie the Robo was like, wow, this is really amazing, uh, an amazing technology. But when I started college, I decided I wanted to be a doctor. There was no such thing as video games, so I don't, what do I know about doing games then? I, I, mean, I, I mean, yes, I could have maybe designed some board games or something like that. And I, I kind of thought about that as a side thing to do at some point. But I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, my family liked the idea of me being a doctor. And I started at UCLA as a pre-med major. Uh, unfortunately, when I took chemistry my first two years at UCLA, I discovered that I also broke more glass in the lab than just about any other student that had ever gone to UCLA. And although I aced all of the written tests, I did not ace the lab. And so I decided that wasn't for me. So I decided I was going to be a math teacher. And I combined the, my interest in mathematics with my interest in tutoring. And I, I, I took courses that I enjoyed at UCLA. And some of these things came back later as an interest in doing video games as well. Because I, I loved using math to depict different uh, graphical properties and, and even comics. And then I also studied the history of mathematics. And at UCLA is where I learned to program. And back then, Fortran was a big language. You had to type into a key punch machine and wait hours to get your printout back to debug your program. And then you better be darn sure that you caught most of your bugs because you have to like make a whole new card deck with the key punch machine, wait another several hours to get your program back, your printout back. So it was quite a task. And then I also worked with Simula, which was the first object-oriented language. Um, and that was in 1972, I believe. So the first object-oriented languages uh, to be used were, were uh, over 40 years ago now. I started as a teacher in mathematics after I got a teaching credential at uh, Cal State University, Los Angeles. And I loved teaching algebra and geometry and uh, was working out near San Bernardino. And I taught mathematics to non-majors as well as majors. And so uh, I had to uh, inspire students with uh, different kinds of math. And so we used puzzles uh, and, and, and also uh, doing things like tax forms. And one of the puzzles that I enjoyed doing was the, tra the uh, traveling salesman problem or shortest path algorithms to see if students could figure out what the shortest path was between maybe 10 different cities. And it was always interesting to see all the different results that got back, even for non-math majors. I mean, there was several interesting and creative solutions. And right around that time, this is 1977, I uh, uh, got a uh, Soul 20, which was an 8080 kit that you could put together the first personal, one of the first personal computers. It was around the time, right around the time Apple II uh, was just starting to come out. And I taught myself assembly language programming. And I wrote some simulations for the classroom and discovered how wonderful it was to, to uh, use computers in the classroom because up until that point, there 
really was no such thing. We had just at that school gotten the pet computer, if you remember the Commodore pet at all, or have read about it. And then I wrote my first game, and that's when I fell in love with doing video games. I basically wrote a 4K chess program in assembly language. Um, and that was on that Soul 20 computer. And my friend, my best, best friend, had also, right at that time, bought the very first uh, chess playing computer that you could buy uh, from the store. And so his computer played my computer, and they played to a draw. And I was so excited, I was like, wow, I played to a draw with a professionally sold device uh, that I decided I need to go back to school and get a software engineering degree. And that's how I ended up at UC Irvine. This was uh, 1979 to 1981, I was at UC Irvine. And that's sort of what the campus looked like. That's from my yearbook. Uh, there was the computer sciences building. I think the library was there, maybe one or two other buildings. And of course, the, the uh, courtyard in the center. Everything else was dirt and maybe a few trees around. And then that's sort of an idea. That's not exactly the lab, but that's sort of what the lab looked like. We had terminals. We programmed it. We learned to program in fourth. Uh, and uh, I think uh, one or two, uh, yeah, this was the other language that we programmed in. And then in uh, the AI course and other courses I took at uh, UC Irvine, I learned algorithms uh, like the knapsack problem and uh, cellular automata, uh, uh, like uh, life. How many of you have ever uh, done like life in hardware or in software? Okay, so you're familiar. Yeah, it's always a good place to start because it's really fascinating to see that you've created this kind of life form all on its own. And it does things that you don't expect, and the same thing with games. Uh, when I did my first chess game, like I said, it played to a draw with that other play computer, and it made moves that I didn't know it could make. So it was, it was, it's pretty exciting to, to see that happen. So I needed a job when I was at UC Irvine. And my first job uh, that I got, well, actually the only job that I got while I was, no, I got two jobs while I was at UC Irvine. This was the first. Uh, I got a job in Mattel Electronics, and I was just pretty excited. And the first day on the job, this is an example of what uh, they showed me to inspire me to work at the film. But television advertising was only one of two key decisions Rupert Elliott made in the 50s. But Let me turn that up a little bit. Elevated Mattel from a profitable business into a corporate giant. The other decision was about the creation of a new dog. Barbie, you're beautiful. So you get the idea. Basically, I got the history of Barbie on my first day of the job. <laughs> and to this day, I, you know, I've never had even thought about Barbie much before, except my sister wrote one, one or two. But to this day, I love Barbie. I think Barbie's wonderful. So <laughs> there, I said it. <laughs> um, so my first game that I worked on was actually handheld games, because there were no, the, the only, um, Video games at that point, uh, around 1978, uh, I think the Atari, v, uh, Atari 2600 had just come out. But they were working in Northern California, and I was in Southern California, so I was doing work at Mattel. But Mattel wasn't into console games yet, so they were doing these handheld games, and one of them was a computer gin game, and I worked on that to make a computer hearts game. Now, I, never, I knew it was never going to get sold, but that was a learning experience for me, and I prototyped that. And then you can see there on the, on the right, that's an example of the kind of system we worked on. It was, a, it was considered a, a, a mini computer, but it really was sort of almost the first microcomputer that professionals used for programming. Uh, it was uh, put out by Deck Computer back then as a PDP-based system. And... Uh, then this came along. Here's an easy question for you. Which of these games is the closest thing to the real thing? A, in television Major League Baseball. B, Atari Baseball. Here they are again, close up. A, in television. B, Atari. So as you can see, the television at the time was like really innovative. It was like, wow, this is really something. You know, I got excited about it. 
And I really got excited when I found out that um, the, see, the initial um, Mattel games were being done by a consulting outfit uh, in Pasadena who was mostly Caltech graduates. Um, the other guy who owned the place was uh, from Caltech. And uh, Mattel decided they were going to do some in-house games. And myself and my boss were the first to get to work on games for the Intellivision. And let's see. OK. So the uh, first game that we chose to do was a bowling game. And I had already done a handheld bowling game, uh, writing that in 1K of code. Uh, Today, what games are megabyte, many megabytes at the minimum, uh, even even in mobile games, uh, probably most mobile games are a megabyte or more. So one K code for a, a, a game is, is pretty pretty uh, rare nowadays. But uh, back then, uh, the chips that they used in these these handheld games were very very inexpensive. That's how they were able to make so many of these handheld games. And uh, so you, you had to write very small, uh, very tight code. And, got a pat and you, I even got a patent on that, uh, that bowling game. But the, the, um, the Intellivision games were done on a VAX computer, uh, the, the development, with a uh, hardware emulator. And you can see the uh, disk packs that we use, the guy's holding one with his hand. Those held one megabyte. That was like a big deal now, of course, one megabyte is like you get the flash drive with a ton more than that. But uh, that, that was a megabyte that we stored our, our programs on. And uh, I also did a couple of prototype games for the, the handheld market that didn't make it to market, volleyball and baseball. So this was this a little example of the finished uh, product. Gives you product. Work, and a bigger challenge. It's more realistic. See how the players move. Hear the sound effects. And you are there. So that's an example of the, the bowling Mattel bowling game that I did. Uh, and that ran in 4K, 4K of code. Uh, and those were that was actually considered the most graphical bowling game to date at that point. So you kind of get the idea of what, where, where things were. And it actually made it into the history of bowling. If you look on the right, there was a, a documentary done several, uh, several years ago. Maybe, I think it might have been the 90s. And they, they mentioned uh, PBA Bowling, which was the Mattel game that they, that they did with uh, Mike Minkoff as the other person who was working on it. But the drive from, I was living in uh, Huntington Beach. I drove to Hawthorne, where Mattel was, drove to Pasadena, where I was doing the development for the bowling game on a television, and then driving over here to the lab at night to work in the lab uh, for my degree at UC Irvine. So it was quite a job driving you know, between all those places. As you can imagine, today it's worse, but the traffic was still pretty bad then. Um, so I decided I needed to get a job closer to Irvine because I really wanted to finish my degree. And uh, so I got a job in doing medical electronics. And uh, I got to work on a uh, device that uh, diagnosed glaucoma for op ophthalmologists. And it had dual processor, which was like a rare thing to work on back then. It actually had like an 8088 and an 8086 or something like in it. And one of the, one of the chips was actually used to scan the eye of the, uh, to, to uh, process the, uh, the data that was coming back from a scan of the eye to make sure that the, the uh, patient wasn't cheating while they were being given the test. And then uh, I also got to put on scrubs. So there, there, you know, I never became a doctor, but at least I got to play doctor for a day and, and uh, watch the uh, surgeries. It was pretty, pretty cool to see, let me tell you. And then I played ping pong during lunch, so that was my first experience with being able to enjoy ping pong, which is still a, a nice to see today. Uh, young engineers are enjoying that as well. So I then, after I'd been there and I got my degree at UC Irvine, it was almost magical because I got a call from a friend at Mattel, who was part of the founder, one of the founders of a startup company in Northern California called the Magic. Um, and the Magic uh, had, I think I was the 30th employer or whatever, and that was my first startup company. And I fell in love with the idea of working at a startup company. 
because a very exciting atmosphere and, and, and very uh, just a lot of fun. Uh, and this is uh, an interview that I did while I was there. The video game lab at Imagic doesn't look like a lab. Well, a lot of times we'll, we'll brainstorm an idea and then we'll have a number of people get together, like programmers, and we'll decide on an idea for a game. Then once you start making the game, you try to have a lot of people play it. And then the programmer can watch them playing the game and decide, well, the, uh, that missile was a little bit a little bit too hard to use, so why don't I change this value in the computer, and it will make that missile a little bit easier to use this time, so I can fire it. You can burn out on bits and bytes just as you can burn out on any job. But by and large, gamers do not work just for the money. And I guess that's why I like doing this, because there's a lot of things that are fun to think about doing. And as a video game programmer, I get to do them all, either through my imagination or or uh, being able to go out and do something for the experience. That was connected to a microsurgeon. A sneak preview of a game that isn't even available in stores yet. This is his latest creation. Instead of zapping invaders from Earth, you zap invaders of the human body as you operate on a video patient. So that's the game that I did that uh, we sold a few hundred thousand of them. It was a, considered a hit back then for the Mattel and television system. And uh, it was a, an exciting time. And, and there, there are, uh, I just wanted to show that as an example of how my interest in being a doctor somehow led to this. I never would have expected that. But, but uh, you'd be open to like any interest you've had that, uh, as a kid or, or even now. Uh, might part, play into uh, an opportunity for you later on. And, and we also ported that, I ported that to uh, Texas Instrument Computer back then as well as the Mattel Television. I think it ran on PC Junior too, one of the other programmers put it on PC Junior. That was the, IBM did that PC Junior right when they introduced the, the PC to um, And I also did a game on trucking. Quick clips. Trucking. And so you were able to like um, go from one city to another. This is again the idea that I had as a teacher, where I was teaching kids uh, who who were non-math majors how to do uh, find the shortest path between places. So you got these road maps, and you tried to figure out how to get from one place to another without crashing. And uh, instead of 3D graphics, which we couldn't do back then, especially in a, if this was a, this might have been an 8K game. Um, but I had graphics in the background to kind of give you an idea where you were going. And in the middle, you could see what highway you were on. But you had to have this map, uh, or else it was very difficult to play, because you needed to know what roads you could go on. And by the way, I got that idea because I had been traveling between um, Southern California and Northern California on the weekends to visit friends and, and, and uh, family. Uh, and seeing all the trucks on I-5 reminded me how much I, I enjoyed seeing trucks. So this, this was, and I, I, get, I get, believe it or not, I get emails still. After this game's over 30, that game was over 30 years old, I still get emails from people who say that they became a trucker after playing trucking. <laughs> so, you never know. Then the video game crash occurred. And uh, during that time, I, I did a, a game for a paper mill company called The Paper Caper. And, and that wasn't something that I necessarily had an interest in as a kid, but I found it fascinating the way a paper mill works. So I, I didn't actually program it, but I designed that game. And I got out of games for a little while. Like I said, the crash occurred, and so I, nobody really knew what was going Nobody knew if Nintendo was going to suddenly become this big deal. Uh, and so I got a job at a company that was doing project management software. I, I really thought the algorithms were cool. And when I was doing software engineering here, <coughs> software engineering here at UC Irvine, uh, I loved working on algorithms. And, and so uh, the uh, critical path and, and, and doing, uh, putting together Gantt charts based on uh, thousands, of, literally thousands of tasks for like building an airport or other you know, huge projects around the world we are going to use this system. Uh, doing doing the, uh, the output for that was pretty exciting. And that company got bought by Oracle. Um, but I, I, I uh, 
went on from there because I got another job doing games. It wasn't a video game company, but RCA Laboratories in New Jersey was doing uh, the first motion video on CD-ROM. And this was around 1984, 85. Um, and uh, we worked with a Bank Street College of Education in New York to develop the first educational video game with uh, motion video on CD-ROM. It's an educational adventure into the discovery and exploration of information. It was designed for home use by school-aged children. Hi, I'm CT from Birds of the Mew. This application takes you from CT's home in the United States to the rainforest of Mexico. A special production technique captures this surrogate travel by shooting one frame of film per human step. You can also choose to look around its... Yes, yeah, so we, we actually were the first, one of the first, not the first, but one of the first, or earliest uh, to use a fisheye camera, which is like, you know, a 180 degree uh, lens, uh, to take pictures, you can see an example there, and then unwrap them into a, you know, panorama. Um, and it worked out really well. With, we, we, this was not, never sold because RCA never made the console they planned to make. They couldn't get the price down to what they wanted. Uh, but we did show this at uh, computer, uh, children's museums uh, around the East Coast. And it was, it was a uh, hit with the kids. Um, and that got sold off to Intel and, and uh, was part of, the, uh, part of it was the DVI technology, which was called Digital Video Interactive, which was very popular for a while before MPEG and, and uh, some of the other video technologies came out. Then I uh, took a break. I, I, uh, creative, creative work and working on the state of the art all the time can be very exhausting. Um, and I, I always loved working on you know, projects that were like really on the edge. And, and most video game developers do, so I wouldn't be surprised if many of you end up doing that or are already doing that. Um, so I took a break and I, I, did, I explored another thing that I really love to do, another interest in travel, which I told you about earlier. And I worked, actually worked, took a course uh, and in Florida, went down there for a break, and uh, I met my wife down there. <laughs> and so uh, after doing that for several months, I decided to get back into games. Uh, actually, I was going to get a job uh, at American Airlines doing uh, some neat stuff they were working on and adding pictures to reservations. This was before the internet. Um, but I, they didn't have a job for me at the time, and so I got a job out in California working for a company called Cinemaware. How many of you heard of Defender of the Crown? Okay, a few of you. Uh, Defender of the Crown was a big hit game for Cinemaware. It's probably the biggest hit they had. Um, and uh, I worked on taking that game and putting it on a CD with CD quality audio. Now, it was never sold, but it was a prototype that we showed at the, uh, probably just the second or third game developers conference up in uh, San Francisco area. And uh, it was supposed to go up to the space station, but I don't think it ever made it. The space station wasn't up yet at that point. But this, this is basically how the game looked. Uh, it was based, the, 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 uh, how the next game I worked on looked which is called It Came From the Desert. It was supposed to be a 50s sci-fi type game. And there's my sci-fi interest uh, coming out. And it was very fun to work on. I actually worked on the tools that the writers use to interactively develop the interactive text for the game. And then that tool I wrote actually packaged up all the data, spit it out over uh, RS-232, which is like really old uh, serial cable technology compared to what you have now. Uh, and uh, put it on the Amiga for the developer who was doing the programming for the game. And I, I, the, I wrote the whole tool in HyperCard, which was the, the, you know, the, the Apple Mac. That was one of the development tools that uh, was available. I just wanted to give you an example of how something you work on, you just never know. I mean, 30 years later, something could happen with that original thing that you worked on in all kinds of ways that you just never imagined. Uh, like I said, I get like emails from people I just never knew that they were, they were enjoyed my games a, as a kid. Um, I had one, uh, the guy, one of the guys who uh, is a co-creator of Game of Thrones, 
if you're if you know that show on HBO, is uh, played microsurgeon as a child many times, like you know for weeks. Uh, and uh, he uh, wrote about it in a chapter in his book called Lucky Wonder Boy. Uh, it's a fictional story of a kid who, who uh, does, plays games for different reasons, and he, and he played microsurgeon uh, to, in order to save his grandmother. And so this is what happened to it. It came from the desert. I just found out that there's somebody making it into a movie this year. Oh, what happened? Uh, sorry, I need to go back. There we go. The desert, unchanged for millions of years. This is what you call reimagining in the movie the industry. Prophecy come true that one day the meek shall inherit the earth. I get a kick, big kick out of this because, of course, we had, you saw the graphics we had with like the, you know, the ant and stuff. Well, watch, watch this ant. Now there's an ant. <laughs> I love that. So then I did get a job at American Airlines. Uh, surprise, surprise! All of a sudden, the job opened up, and I, I couldn't resist because I, I, I worked there for five years on changing from, you can see on the left, the, the travel agent interface, which is all text-based, adding hotel graphics and cruise graphics and making the things a lot more interesting for travel agents. And then taking that, and I didn't actually uh, move it all the way over to what you know, Travelocity or travel interfaces today, but some of the early work I did in, in user interface design, I spent two years uh, working with travel agents and with the uh, 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 several of the executives at American Airlines in um, uh, presenting different user interfaces and how that might be used in the future. And some of that actually got rolled into Travelocity later on, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Then I got a call from uh, some friend, uh, Mike, uh, his name is Mark Klein, who had worked uh, at a, a, magic, a Magic with me that they had started a company called Digital Pictures uh, and they were doing motion video on Sega CD. And so the first game I worked on was an educational game. And here is my teaching coming out again. I just, I like to teach. So uh, we got a chance to teach kids about using construction equipment. So this was a, a six, Sega CD was a dual processor 68,000 system, so it had two processors in it. And they had a bank switch memory, so you had to like switch the memory to make sure that one, you know, one was talking to memory while the other wasn't. And uh, it was almost, a, it was a parallel processing type of system. We didn't have multiple cores back then. This is in the 90s. So, So we had actors, uh, there was a video shoot, um, that was pretty rare back then, you didn't see that much, uh, that was the mid-90s about when this kind of thing started to happen, where you, you had actors in, in video games. And so they could choose what kind of construction equipment they wanted to work on. Um, they had very simple interfaces, this is for very young children. Um, which I had not actually taught before, so it was kind of interesting to, to uh, do some marketing tests with young children with this. And the, the really young ones really liked it. The older ones got bored with it very quickly, but really young children liked this. You could do silly things like dump dirt on the actors and, and uh, pick them up with the backhoe and stuff like that. And then we took a game called Double Switch, which was a big success on uh, Sega CD and uh, put that on Windows 95. And that music is by Thomas Dolby, a, a music uh, composer, um, who had a lot of success with other, other music back in the 90s.
stop it for a second. It reminded me, that one thing, if you, if you haven't done video games much yet, or you have only done a little bit, uh, if you end up doing anything with motion video in it or music in it, be prepared to hear it over and over and over. And my poor wife has heard these songs over and over about a bazillion times. So this game had this multiple rooms. Really sucks. And so I built all these traps and security systems to protect the people who live here. So the idea was that you would you would flip this the trap at the wrong. right time to trap a person. That's Elizabeth. And She's then you'd get uh, some information you needed later to unlock okay. the code so he could get out and win the game. Going off in Alex's apartment. Use your cursor to get up there. See what's going on. So we're actually streaming video, even off of this very slow CD ROM on Sega CD. Uh, it's quite a challenge to get this to work. And then especially on the Windows to get it to work, because Windows had the own its operating system. Windows 95 didn't have much of a multi-processing operating system at the beginning. So the other, the other thing you need to get used to if you work with motion video or actors at all is somebody you work with that you don't know who they are, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, they may be a huge star. Going back to that game I showed you earlier with uh, the Palenque uh, uh, interactive game for RCA Laboratories, remember the little kid at the beginning, CT? He's Ben Affleck. <laughs> so, I, and I only found this out about maybe 10 years ago. I had no idea that was Ben Affleck at the time. So then I ended up going to Microsoft because Microsoft liked the work I did because it did the last two weeks of that project doing double switch for Windows. Um, I had worked at Microsoft to not only debug the game, but to debug their code for uh, DirectX, it was the first version of DirectX, DirectX 1.0, uh, and uh, what are they on now? 11, 12, I forgot what number. 12, 12. 12 DirectX 12, so it's <laughs> come a long way since DirectX 1. And it was actually Video Studio version 1 as well. Um, so I got hired into Microsoft because I was gonna work on interactive TV, but I ended up working on um, a well similar kind of thing which is an interactive program TV guide uh, for Windows 95 so the I mean 98 so the work that we did got rolled into the Windows 98 team and ended up on Windows 98 Windows 2000 kind of a strange place for a video game developer to be but like I said you never know where you're gonna end up and it actually was pretty a lot of neat people to work with and then later I ended up doing uh, a couple of games for Xbox that didn't ship, but I got to work uh, for several months with Alexei Pagetov, who, does anybody know who that is? Tetris. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. very good. Yes, he's the designer and creator of Tetris. And not everybody in America necessarily knows who he is or knows how famous, famous he is, but I can tell you when he goes back to Russia, because I worked with uh, one of the Russian teams while I was working on one of the games, uh, he is like superstar, <laughs> very famous. And uh, anyway, we, the game that we did was a puzzle game and I worked on it for several months, but unfortunately marketing decided that it wasn't quite right for what they wanted for first releases for Xbox. So then I worked on a game called uh, 21, which was based on the TV show 21, which was one of those trivia game shows. And I uh, worked on that for several months and unfortunately the game show got canceled and so they canceled the game. So another thing that uh, you learn in the video game industry is not everything you do ever makes it out the door. Or it might make it out the door a lot later than you thought. But those didn't make it to market. So I, le I left Microsoft after being there for years and uh, ended up uh, doing some contract work. And I, I, this is the only game I ever did that was uh, related to uh, military. Uh, they were working on a training system, so again, my teaching background, uh, for the landware system, which is advanced uh, networking and, and uh, stuff built into their guns and their holsters and 
And they even have little, like you can see there at the top, little uh, computer system that they could put on their belt. Um, and the, one of the neat things about it was we were able to tie it into the API for an actual video game, uh, Delta Force, and uh, use the GPS and everything else that the system used to give them a real-time uh, uh, video game experience uh, in learning how to use the landware system, which I believe was trialed during the Iraq, Iraq War. So after I uh, uh, got uh, to be a, um, a uh, classic video game developer, which is I guess any video game developer that started 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, I uh, decided I wanted to try something else and I, I started to write. I, I love science fiction a lot and I hadn't had time to do this. So for several years now I've been writing science fiction short stories and I really enjoy doing that. Um, I've also designed a couple of game or game-like things. I did an interactive uh, ebook, which I may put into a, a mobile game actually at some point that I call Movie Magic Squares, which I took data from the moviedb.org. They allowed me to do this and created um, these uh, uh, matrices where I've got different movies and different actors and you're supposed to figure out what actors were in which movies that line up appropriately in the boxes. And I'm just finishing up a solitaire game, like my love of cards again. Uh, it also includes my love of genealogy. I've grown to really enjoy doing genealogy research. Um, and so this, this actually has a tree structure, a solitaire game with a tree structure. And uh, you can go several levels deep building your tree. With, uh, and the idea is to get the best poker hand in each level of the tree. And there are other poker type games I've discovered combined with solitaire, uh, but uh, my game is very different in that it has a tree structure and, and it plays differently. Uh, so finally, I just want to wrap by saying that I've met a lot of really interesting people along the way. Probably one of the most fun things about working in video games besides the technology itself is the people you're going to meet. Um, I'm sure you've met plenty of interesting people right here and, and maybe in the jobs that you're doing and you'll probably continue to do so. Uh, and these are what they started doing <clears throat> when I met them. But later on, uh, Sandra Morris I met uh, while I was at uh, RCA, and she was a manager, and then she became the CIO of Intel, and later VP at uh, Kodak. Uh, Dan, Don Daglo, who you may have heard of, uh, is a pretty big, uh, historically in the video game industry, is a big figure. Uh, he started Stormfront Studios after he worked at Mattel. Uh, and uh, they had a lot of successes with different, uh, different games. Alexi, of course. Uh, Bonnie Ross uh, was a woman who led the, the Xbox group that I was uh, working in when I was at Microsoft, and now she's uh, head of the entire Halo studio at, at Microsoft. Um, Keith Robinson is interesting to me because he worked at Mattel also, and, uh, but he also loves doing other things like I do and several video game people I know. He's uh, also a cartoon, professional cartoonist. Uh, and Steve Russell, a man who uh, worked at, uh, uh, well, he was writing languages. He developed uh, several versions of Lisp while he was at uh, MIT, I believe. Uh, he designed uh, uh, one of the, he designed the first game, I think, on a uh, uh, star, I can't remember the name, star something. That was back on the other page, wasn't it? Yeah, so, uh, Space War, sorry. Space War, which is kind of an asteroids kind of game. He actually designed it on an oscilloscope using a VAX computer. And anyway, it, in his, when he was in his 60s, he was still programming games. He worked at Digital Pictures while I was there doing, you know, working on uh, some of the games that we had done. So you never know where it's going to quite lead you. This is an example of uh, my interests in bubbles and how they're connected to like a lot of the different things I've worked on. So you can see how like what your interests are might connect to a lot of different things. And finally, uh, as you stay creative, you get different viewpoints from the different things that you do. And if you look at these three mountains, they're all the tallest in the world depending on what your perspective is, whether you're looking for the very highest mountain 
or the closest to the moon because it sits on a bubble in, in the, the equator, which is uh, Chimbazaro, or it's because it's uh, the tallest from the bottom of the ocean to the, to the top, like Mauna Kea. Uh, so as I said, uh, when you uh, stay creative throughout your career, uh, enjoy the perspective and enjoy the view. And that's my talk. Quick questions. I guess I wrapped it up around the end of my time. Yes. Um, do you ever like have a like a, a moment where you're like, okay, if I pursue this, this is going to be something like really weird, really interesting. It's going to <coughs> help me build this kind of uh, like cre like uh, creative perspective, or like it's going to help me build a perspective that is really going to help me have a unique take on things? Like, do you ever have that? Or like Absolutely. Yeah. When I did the medical electronics, I, I think that that was definitely my, my idea was to you know, just do something different. Uh, because first of all, it was going to build me skills that were going to come in handy later on that not every video game developer at that time mm -hmm. had worked on a dual processor system or understood, you know, because you're not necessarily you may be on the leading edge as a video game developer on some things, but not the leading edge like the military might be on. Or whatever. I even considered that at one point, but I decided that didn't, it was too far out. They wanted me to work on artificial intelligence uh, for tanks in the, uh, in the 80s, and, and I decided I didn't want to do that. But, but yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have any advice for people like, trying to recognize those moments for like the not so obvious gems that they might be, or well, I I I, I go back to my uh, one of my previous slides, which was near the end. Um, let's see, I went through it kind of quickly. Right, what you, a lot of uh, authors, uh, a lot of publishers, tell you when a, when a young author says, "Well, what should I write about?" and the publisher might say, "Well, write what you know." This is very often the advice for, for young writers, is write what you know. But I like better what I've heard from some writers, or write what you want to know. So if you have an interest and you're excited about it, then maybe it's something you, you ought to explore, because it could come back to helping you to write what you know, because now you know about it. Or, you may, or like when I did Microsurgeon, I spent literally like uh, probably six weeks checking every book out of the library and reading everything I could about anatomy, which I had never done when I wanted to be a doctor. I didn't get that far, <laughs> but I ended up doing it anyway. So maybe if I had done it earlier, I wouldn't have had to do it, but I, but I did, and uh, it paid off for me because I was able to work with that and the artist uh, in our company. Uh, we actually had an art team at a Magic, which was very rare at that time. I think we were the first art team. Uh, they were the first art team with a video game company. Uh, and, but had I not had all those pictures from the anatomy books to show him, he and I were, would not have been able to come up with that, that uh, you know, famous microsurgeon image, which, by the way, ended up on the cover of two music albums and, uh, and, and uh, IEEE Spectrum and some other magazines. So. Thanks, great question. Yes? How did you know that a new opportunity you're pursuing was worth pursuing and it was time to move on to something new? Because that's, that's a hard decision to make. It's a very hard decision to make, and I, 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 the only thing I can really say is, is God. You know, you have to go with your God, and, and sometimes you miss things. I didn't mention it, but when I, was, uh, when I showed off Microsurgeon at the Consumer Electronics Show, it won an award for Most Creative Game of the Year. And uh, this man stopped by my booth, and he had just started a company. I mean, it hadn't been six months, maybe he tops a year earlier. And he gave me his card, and he said that, uh, you know, come see me sometime. You know, I really liked the work that you did. Well, I didn't, I didn't follow it up. And, 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 you know, I ended up with some, a lot of great opportunities. But it was Trip Hawkins, he had just started Electronic Arts. So you never know. You, you, you know, you, you will pass up some opportunities. But, but if you go with your gut, a lot of times, it, it, for me, it paid off. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much for coming and, and uh, listening. <laughs>